Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Serious concerns have arisen regarding Great Canadian Gaming, the company that is the government's hand-picked choice to operate the Woodbine Casino. It is alleged that organized crime funneled questionable money through a BC casino operated by Great Canadian Gaming. Gamblers allegedly, this is unbelievable, brought in hockey bags stuffed with apparent drug money to be washed through the casino. This has led to a large-scale investigation. The Premier has said she's paying close attention to it. That's not good enough, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, is the government not concerned about getting into business with a company that there's an ongoing investigation underway? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Finance will want to comment. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, my understanding is that the procurement decision was made by the OLG, the government of Ontario was not involved, and that the Great Canadian uh, Gaming Company is not part of the BC review, nor are they uh, under any criminal investigation, Mr. Speaker. The OLG, as I said this morning, has uh, anti money laundering provisions in place for all gaming sites throughout the province and is in compliance with all federal anti money laundering rules. Rules. The AGCO and OLG conducted rigorous background checks on Great Canadian Gaming as part of the procurement process, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Finance has already been in touch with OLG. And as I said earlier, earlier to the, uh, the media, Mr. Speaker, we are paying very close attention to this uh, because of what has happened in uh, British Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from. Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, uh, Speaker. Back to the Premier. These allegations are exactly why this casino deal must be halted immediately. The fact the government isn't concerned about these allegations is shocking. When the casino contract was awarded, the minister told reporters he was, quote, extremely excited about the deal. But once charges were announced, the minister said he was not involved and unaware. If the finance minister didn't know about it, then he's in dereliction of his duty. If he did know, then why did he tell the media he wasn't aware? Speaker, we need to get to the bottom of this. Did the minister know his hand-picked casino operator is linked to a money laundering investigation? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, it's obvious that the members opposite are doing everything they can to deflect, to deflect the fact that they don't have a plan, they have no idea as to where they're going, and they're now. Their arguments with the term alleged, Mr. Speaker. Let me be clear. The integrity of this process is of the utmost importance. Uh, the understanding, and my understanding, is that Great Canadian Gaming is not under investigation. The opposition allegations are misinformed and ignore the facts. Both Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario and the OLG conducted rigorous background checks as part of the procurement process in the selection of the service provider. The OLG has strict anti money laundering programs in place, which are compliant with the federal anti money laundering rules. Answer. The AGCO has also performed extensive and independent due diligence into current and past business practices and conduct before registering Thank a gaming you. operator. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Internal government documents reveal a $500 million money laundering investigation in BC. Wow. We read about, quote, suspicions of terrorist financing, possible organized crime connections, hockey duffel bags full of cash, tens of millions of dollars in $20 bills. Who does that? The RCMP investigation goes back to 2015. They said there was about $220 million laundered in BC in one year alone. How can this have all happened under the minister's nose? We need to get to the bottom of this. Speaker to the Premier, what did the finance minister know and when did he know it? Again, let me be clear. It's my understanding that the Great Canadian is not under investigation. We have, and the AGCO and the BC regulators are in contact, and they have been throughout the process, Mr. Speaker. But the member opposite is making allegations and now inferring 
criminal activity by a public company. I'll leave him to live with that fact, Mr. Speaker, but we on this side of the House have a process in place, a procurement that is fair and transparent. It has to follow due diligence before it proceeds to where it goes, Mr. Speaker. And I recognize that the member opposite Minister, is trying to spin and provide some, to order. some indication of blame, but what we need to do is be fair in the process and let the process do its due course. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. We are now in the third week of a province-wide college strike. For three weeks, students have been left in flux, not sure if their semester, if their year, if their time in education is going to be lost because of this strike. Mr. Speaker, we can't gamble with our students' education. So, Mr. Speaker, my question Minister to the of Premier, Infrastructure. Despite the fact this has gone on now for three weeks, the member from Renfrew. why is there no urgency to this? Why has the Premier done nothing to get both sides back to the table? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I, you know, I absolutely am concerned about this. Mr. Speaker, uh, we want to see students back in the classroom. Uh, both the minister and I have an expectation, Mr. Speaker, that both sides will uh, find a way to get back to the table. That that's where the agreement needs to be, Mr. Speaker. And it is certainly, it is certainly my intention, Mr. Speaker, that no student would lose their term because of this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister is in conversation. Member of Niagara West Clam with, uh, with parties, Mr. Speaker, we are encouraging both sides to get back to the table. But, Mr. Speaker, the agreement needs to be forged at the table, and that's why both sides need to get back to the table and get that uh, agreement signed. Thank Mr. you, Speaker. supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier says she's concerned, but she's done nothing for three weeks to get both sides back to the table. We need more than concern. You know, this strike has been called anxiety-inducing for many students needing to complete their semester. And just for the Premier to appreciate the urgency of this, let me share a story from Morgana Sampson, president of the Fanshawe Student Union, and what she told the media that students in trade and apprenticeship programs are at particular risk. Those students rely on employment insurance while in school, but that funding has been halted during the college strike. Sampson said they are left without a job, without schooling, and without funding to live off. A very precarious situation. Mr. Speaker, why isn't the Premier doing more? It Saying you're concerned is not enough. I want to know what the Premier is going to do to get both sides back to the table Question. immediately. Well, Speaker, I, I want to begin by saying this is a very troubling uh, strike situation. We are very concerned about it. Sure would love to know the plan they have, Speaker, to get both sides together. Um, I have been meeting with. The member from Whitby, Oshawa, will come to order. I've been standing for a few seconds now, and the Minister of Economic Development and Growth come to order. A refresher. When I stand, you stop everything. Finish, please. Uh, Speaker, both the Premier and I are, uh, are very strongly encouraging the big talks to get back in action. We want to play that game. I'll win. We're going to warnings. Carry on. Uh, Speaker, we have been very clear. We want to get both sides back to the table. That's where the solution will be found. In the meantime, I'm meeting with several uh, student groups, including Morgana Simpson at Fanshawe College, and we're making sure. The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Carry on. We're making sure that students have the information they need Answer. to get through the strike, Speaker. This is a very difficult situation. We are hoping it will be resolved soon. If I knew the person would be warned. Supplementary. Final supplementary. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Back to the Premier. But I have to say, as a former part time instructor in the college system, I have to give this government answer uh, a failing grade to date. Colleges are trying to reassure students that there's a plan in place 
to save the semester. However, OPSU states the plan hasn't been shared with faculty. In fact, uh, they say there hasn't been any consultation uh, at all about saving the semester, yeah. and that's certainly not reassuring to anyone involved. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier explain why there have been no consultations to save the semester? And if there is a plan, can she share it with us today? These students deserve that peace of mind. They do. Thank you. Well, Speaker, every college is working on contingency plans, and the ministry is involved in contingency plans uh, for those in apprenticeship program. Speaker, I was pleased to see that Morgana was quoted on the meeting that we had. She said it was extremely well. It went extremely well. It was very productive. Uh, now that we've had these meetings, we're sure the government is looking out for us. That is a student leader speaking about what this government is doing to support students through this process. Thank you. New question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On Tuesday, October the 3rd, the Minister of Health told this House, in response to my colleague's question about severe hospital overcrowding, that the NDP was fear-mongering for partisan political reasons. On Thursday, October the 5th, Hamiltonian Jim Stan Sanford was lying on an ambulance stretcher in an inside a packed ER crying in pain for more than four hours before the paramedics gave him pain medication. No one from the hospital was available. Does the Premier still think that shining a light on hospital overcrowding is fear-mongering? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I'm certainly happy to look into that specific occurrence. Uh, it is uh, uh, the obligation of all of us in the health care system to provide the highest quality care. But with regards to Hamilton, that's precisely why, in terms of capacity challenges because of a growing population and an aging, more complex uh, population, that's precisely why we're increasing the number of acute care beds by 54 wow. in Hamilton alone, wow. Mr. Speaker. And there's an additional set aside of additional acute inpatient beds should Hamilton or that entire Lynn require them as we go into the flu season, Mr. Speaker. It's important to recognize that the majority of hospitals in this province do yes, not sir. have capacity challenges, but where they do exist, we are making the necessary investments Thank to you. ensure that the beds are available. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Jim's family describes his time at Jerevinsky Hospital in Hamilton as chaotic. Jim was a cancer patient. He fell at home and was brought to Jerevinsky after the hospital closer to his home was too full to accept him. The four hours he spent in the overcrowded ER saw him go from smiling and waving to no longer being able to speak. The ER was so overcrowded that Jim's stretcher was parked barely inside the ER sliding door, which opened every time he moved. His decline in the ER while waiting for medical care was so fast and stark that medical staff told his family he could die, and soon. Jim's widow told the media, an emergency is an emergency. It shouldn't be waiting forever. Why doesn't this premier agree? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, um, I'm sorry that uh, this individual had the health care experience that he did at Jurovinsky Hospital in Hamilton. It is a great regional cancer centre providing excellent cancer care to Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, and we have a good, uh, we have a great cancer care system in this province. It's not perfect. Just like we have great hospitals across this province, they're not always perfect. I'm happy to look into the instance, this specific occurrence, Mr. Speaker, but that's why we're making the investments that we are. We're making those investments in cancer care so that on a global level, we have one of the best cancer care systems in the entire world. In terms of outcomes, we have some of the best cancer outcomes with regards to survival in the Answer. entire world, Mr. Speaker. That doesn't mean that unfortunate incidents such as this may happen. I'm happy to look into this. Thank you. Final supplementary. I wish the minister would listen to my question. I'm talking about the ER, not about the care in Jerevinsky for cancer patients. When, the, when Jim was finally admitted into the ER, it was into a curtained-off section that his family said was no better than the hallway. 
It was so crowded, it just felt stifling, said Jim's daughter. After another three hours, Jim's family became desperate just to get him out of the ER before he died there. Jim wanted to spend his last few days with his family in his home. Instead, he spent hours in an overcrowded ER in pain while his family frantically tried to move him somewhere more private. Jim died four days after this ER visit. His family doesn't blame the paramedics or the hospital staff. They point the finger directly at province-wide hospital overcrowding Question. which has left hospitals with more patients than beds. What does the Premier have to say to Jim's family today? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, I'm very uh, sorry and disturbed by the the, the untimely death of, uh, of this uh, individual, and my heart and sorrow goes out to his family and his friends and loved ones, Mr. Speaker, that uh, when it comes to hospital overcrowding, uh, that's precisely why we made the investment that we did to keep up with those specific hospitals where they're seeing an increased volume in their ERs because we have a growing and an aging population. And just like the member opposite seemed not to support our investment in the, hum in the former Finch site, the former Humber River Hospital site, to bring more patients out of hospital, to open up hospital beds, I'm still not sure if she supports or doesn't support our investment of $100 million to create 1,200 new acute care beds in hospitals across this province, including at the Jurabinsky site. New question, the member from Nickelville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier and her Minister of Health offered Ontario Hospital a temporary band aid solution to the ongoing overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis in Ontario. Anything helps, but the Premier still doesn't seem to understand the magnitude of the problem. The temporary beds she announced are not nearly enough to reverse the damage from years of cuts and freeze under the Premier and her Liberal government. For example, in North Bay Regional Health Centre, they have been forced to lay off over 400 frontline care workers, and they often will have to warn the community about bed shortage. They call it bed crisis days. The Premier plan is to give North Bay eight temporary beds. Does she really think that this Question. is enough to reverse the damage of years of underfunding by this Liberal government. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to speak to the specifics, but just let me say, Mr. Speaker, that there have been years of increases to the health care budget in this province under this government, Mr. Speaker. Every single year, funding has gone up across the system, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that there are, there are system challenges that need to be addressed. And it was interesting, on the weekend, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to uh, spend a substantial time with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders from the States, Mr. Speaker, and we were touring hospitals in, uh, in Toronto, Mr. Speaker, and it was a great opportunity to have a conversation about what's really working here in, uh, in Ontario in our universally accessible, publicly funded health care system, Mr. Speaker, and where there are challenges. Answer. But one of the things that really wor is working, Mr. Speaker, we are able to plan. We are able to look at where the gaps are and find solutions Thank to you. those problems, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Sioux Area Hospital used the phrase code burgundy to describe times when overcrowding was so bad that the code was announced to start a coordinated effort to find extra beds for patients. In January of this year, the hospital scrapped code burgundy altogether, not because the overcrowding crisis had gotten better, but because it had become meaningless. They were calling it each and every day. The Sioux Area Hospital has the second highest occupancy rate of any hospital for, from 2012 to 2016. They peaked at 121 per cent occupancy. The Premier has offered Sault Ste. Marie Hospital eight temporary beds to solve this crisis. How can the Premier and the Minister of Health be so out of Question. touch with the challenges faced by Sault Ste. Marie Hospital? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, after uh, providing the Sioux Hospital with an increase of over $6 million this year in their operating budget, which represents, by the way, I think it's the highest in the province, wow. a 4.93 per cent increase That's to their great. operating budget this year. We did allocate additional acute inpatient beds, uh, as we did for North Bay, as the member herself has just referenced. Mr. Speaker, it's important when we look at the Northeast Lynn as well, there's an additional set aside of as yet unallocated, an additional 31 beds that will be allocated by hospitals in concert with the Northeast Lynn. And Mr. Speaker, well, in the coming weeks, uh, ahead Answer. so we can specifically target those beds where they're needed most, and we can also prudently allocate them in response to what we anticipate being a uh, Thank you. severe flu season. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Health Sciences North in my hometown of Sudbury has been offered 16 temporary beds to address the overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis. Every single day, Speaker, Health Sciences North is forced to house 30 to 35 sick patients in hallway, TV room, and anywhere else they can find. The 16 temporary bed offer don't even address the shortage faced by Health Sciences North, North right now, never mind when flu season hits. How does the Premier expect this 16 beds to solve the ongoing overcrowding crisis that she has helped create in our hospitals. Thank you. Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are allocating additional acute inpatient beds across this province, 1,200 of them. In addition to that, we're creating approximately 600 transitional spaces to provide specialized care for people that no longer need to be in hospital, and 200 uh, affordable housing specifically for seniors. But what we won't do, Mr. Speaker, I can only imagine if we took the advice of the NDP when they were in power and they closed 24 per cent of all the acute beds across this province, 13 per cent of the mental health beds across this province, for a total of 9 600 bed closures, Mr. Speaker, doing a short period of time when they were in power. Answer. If we were to take their approach, let alone their minister of cuts that would have taken additionally $500 million out of health care and education, yeah. I can't imagine Thank where you. it would be. Yeah. Question, the member from the P and Carlton. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, this weekend, the headline read, quote, a tale of duplicity or ineptitude. And no, Mr. Speaker, this was not the title of a new book recapping the last 14 years of the Liberal government. It wasn't even a news story about Bill Morneau. It was a National Post headline regarding the last uh, latest testimony in the gas plant trials. The article stated that 21 minutes after Laura Miller responded, quote, I have no records to a freedom of information request about the gas plants, it is alleged that Laura Miller's life partner, Peter Feist, tried to wipe her desktop computer clean. Mr. Speaker, that is 21 minutes. Is this the new gold standard for what constitutes open and transparent government with this Liberal Party? Thank you, Premier. Attorney General. Attorney General. I think, uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I think the member opposite very well knows, and I think she's been. Um, all, all members know the rules quite well. That when uh, issues before the courts, we don't discuss those issues in the matter. So I'm glad that she's reading her National Post on Saturday mornings and and can read those headlines back to us. But I think she very well knows, Speaker, that uh, there is a live case that is going on as we speak, and we should respect that process, uh, and this, the legislature is not the place uh, to, the, to discuss the evidence that is before the course. Thank you. Supplementary. What's troubling for people on this side of the House and the people of Ontario is that it was very clear that those that testified before the Justice Committee in the last parliament didn't necessarily have respect for this assembly. And uh, whether it's hockey bags full of money or deleted emails, Pete's project is back on the stand today in a courtroom down the street. We learned, quote, at one point Point during the process of clearing the hard drives, Feist emailed Miller to say, quote, things aren't going well, may have to wipe them. She replied, uh-oh. So, Mr. Speaker, uh-oh, uh -oh. with the history and track record of this government, how can we be sure there aren't any more uh-ohs happening right now in that government?
Attorney General. Well, uh, you know, I'm not surprised that a party without any substantive plan is the one who's going to ask questions like these and try to try to just read some bits and pieces from a newspaper article, Speaker, and not respect our legal process. Speaker, on this side of the House, we have utmost respect for our, our court processes. We have utmost respect for our, 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 our judiciary, Speaker, and we have the utmost respect for the for the rules. And that is why our government has been focused, Speaker, in making sure that we introduce more accountability and transparency by making sure that we have a directive uh, sent to all political staff, that we have mandatory training programs, Speaker. We have appointed chiefs of staff who are accountable for rec record creeping, and we have improved archiving requ uh, requirements, not to mention, Speaker, we have passed the Ac Accountability Act, which prohibits the willful deletion of records and creates a penalty for doing so. That's the record of this government, Speaker. Yes, We're proud of that. Thank you. New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. According to statistics published by the Ministry of Transportation, the number of deaths caused by distracted walking did not increase at all between 1993 and 2012. This means there's little or no evidence that the advent of cell phones has led to an increase in deaths due to distracted walking. However, these MTO statistics show that deaths due to distracted driving nearly tripled during the same time. The OPP says distracted driving now causes more deaths than impaired driving or speeding. So why is the government contemplating a bill that treats distracted walking as the problem and not distracted driving? Thank you. Your transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I uh, think the member from Parkdale High Park knows that this is a private member's bill that she's alluding to that I anticipate will be brought forward at some point to the legislature, Speaker. On the larger topic that was uh, contained or embedded in her question, I think she knows uh, that on this side of the House, our Premier and our government have moved forward aggressively in targeting distracted driving and impaired driving, Speaker, uh, and a whole host of other initiatives that we've undertaken through two pieces of legislation, Bill 31 and Bill 65, that have passed here uh, over the last couple of years. Just a few weeks ago, the Premier announced, and I announced as well with the Premier, that we're going forward with additional proposals to toughen some of these sanctions, Speaker. For the last 16 consecutive years, the province of Ontario has ranked first or second across North America for road safety. But, Speaker, we know that our work is not done. It's why the ministry is focused exclusively on making sure Answer. that we have the toughest penalties for those behaviors that are, that are not acceptable, Speaker, and we're going to keep working hard to make sure that we get it right. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question back to the Premier. I'm sure that the Minister of Transportation was very well aware of this private member's bill coming forward and, in fact, vetted it. Last week, the group Friends and Family for Safe Streets organized a vigil at Toronto City Hall to remember the 54 people who have died this year alone from traffic violence. There was also a ghost bike ride for David De Los Santos, who was killed by a truck driver after dropping off his daughter at school. He did nothing wrong. Drivers who commit offences that seriously injure or kill vulnerable road users face no meaningful consequences. They can simply mail in a check. Instead of bills that blame victims, will the government pass my Bill 168, the Protecting Question. Vulnerable Road Users Act, and take real action to protect pedestrians, cyclists, seniors, and children who share our Thank streets? You. Minister. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. So I'm going to do my best to give the member from Parkdale High Park the benefit of the doubt, Speaker. I know that she is an advocate for making sure that we also work collectively and collaboratively pr to protect our most vulnerable road users. But that member also knows that just a few days ago, we announced as a government that we'd be moving forward with a number of legislative proposals that will be introduced later this year, Speaker, that would also include in them the toughest penalty, if passed, the toughest penalty in the Highway Traffic Act, uh, uh, the uh, uh, careless driving causing bodily harm or death on the road, Speaker, that would contain uh, up to a $50,000 fine if convicted, and also no more than two years in jail. Speaker, again, the toughest penalty uh, in the Highway Traffic Act if passed. In addition, Speaker, we continue to have crackdowns on distracted driving, impaired driving, both alcohol uh, and drug impaired driving. Speaker, we continue to drive home the message that we have to protect our yes, most sir. vulnerable road users. That's why we passed Bill 65, Speaker. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, safety in school zones and community safety zones. It's why we're working Thank closely you. with the OPP and other speakers. Thank you.
New question. The member from Ajax Pickering. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. We know the minister has been a tireless advocate for the establishment of Rouge National Urban Park for nearly 30 years. He's planted trees there endlessly alongside some of our other caucus members and many supporters of the park, protecting green spaces in one of Canada's most populated and culturally diverse metropolitan area, the Greater Toronto Area, is no easy task, but it's one of the great importance to our government. We have been leaders in establishing and expanding protected areas, part of the Green Belt, Oak Ridges, Moraine, and the Niagara Escarpment, to name a few. Mr. Speaker, we continue to work together with municipalities to ensure that our cities and towns grow sustainably. Everyone can enjoy the natural beauty of our province to hike, bike, swim, paddle, and even camp. Minister, a week ago, you were at Question. Hunter Memorial Park to make an important announcement. Uh, could you please give us and provide us more information about this great news? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member and all the members from the Legislature that attended that really, uh, really, really emotional uh, uh, event that we had about a week, and, week or so ago. And, and uh, re public representatives from all three levels of government were there, Indigenous leaders, uh, staff from Parks Canada. Uh, as well as uh, advocates and, and community groups and environmental groups that have worked on this matter for almost 30 years, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, this is rather personal to me because I was a staffer here 30 years ago when I began working on this issue. So I want to thank the Premier and my colleague, the Minister of Infrastructure, for allowing me to carry this file over the finish line. Uh, it really was an honour for me to be there a week Saturday to make this announcement that indeed we are transferring 1,600 acres Answer. of environmentally sensitive lands to Parks Canada so that future generations will enjoy this natural yeah. oasis Good in work. the middle of our city, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister, uh, for that information and once again for being such a strong champion of this park and ensuring the condition for ecological integrity was met. I know it's a tough fight, but it was worth to see the incredibly diverse natural area receives the strongest protection. Mr. Speaker, it's my understanding that the park is now close to 80 square kilometers, which is 23 times bigger than Central Park in New York and 50 times bigger than High Park in Toronto. The park now links Lake Ontario to the Oak Ridges Moraine, and it is Canada's first ever national urban park. The Canadian and Ontario governments, Indigenous peoples, environmental groups and farmers all work together to make the most of a rare opportunity to protect precious green space to the edge of the country's biggest city for generations to come. Mr. Speaker, there are so many exciting Question. things for us to explore to do in the Rouge. What is the best way for individuals and families to enjoy the park and learn about its many treasures? Thank you. Minister. To the Minister of Education, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to rise in the House and to talk about uh, the Rouge National Urban Park. And I want to say thank you to the member from Oak Ridges Markham, as well as the member from Scarborough Centre, who was there as this park was being transferred to the uh, federal government in terms of the final um, details. Mr. Speaker, Elder Sue, who was there said that Rouge Park has retained its splendor, and indeed it has. And the students at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus have developed the Rouge app. La Rouge, Mr. Speaker. This app developed by student entrepreneurs who are part of a program called The Hub, which is an incubator, Mr. Speaker, that's uh, developing innovative programs, have, have really developed a remarkable um, system to navigate the park and to really explore its splendor. Answer. And, Mr. Speaker, I would encourage all members of the House to download this app and to visit the Rouge National Urban Park. And thank you so much <laughs> to the you. member for Scarborough, Scarborough Centre. Thank you. I'd like to remind the Minister of Education when I stand, you sit. I don't need a parrot. No question. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, my constituents find it outrageous that environmental approvals from two decades ago could be used to open a mega dump on the ED19 site. 
Much has changed in 20 years, including legislation actually protecting the environment. Minister, you recently received three expert reports from the Canadian Environmental Law Association documenting changes to site conditions. The township of Edwardsburg Cardinal has declared itself an unwilling host. Speaker, the minister's predecessor committed in writing that a change in circumstances or new information that wasn't presented at the time of approval would allow for reconsideration. Speaker, the minister now has both. Will he commit to revoking those stale-dated approvals or sending this matter to the Environmental Review Tribunal? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, Speaker, our uh, our minister's priority, ministry's priority, is to divert as much waste uh, from landfill as we possibly can. You know, and I can say that through our, our waste diversion efforts, we're, we're keeping about three million tons of waste out of landfills every year. But you know. We recognize, Speaker, that, that solutions need to be put in place for waste that, that can't be diverted. You know, I can say that uh, currently this group is, uh, uh, is required to undertake consultation and studies and in order to determine if the project can be done in a way that is protective of both environment, uh, the environment and, and of human health. You know, the proposal will, will be subjected to a number of, uh, of uh, ongoing assessments and review, uh, and the, uh, the organization will will need to continue to uh, consult with the public and, and with all stakeholders speaker Thank you. supplementary back to the minister speaker a dump has never opened in ontario with such outdated approvals it's unprecedented and hardly the legacy this minister or this premier would want and remember they were granted for a municipally operated landfill for waste from leeds and grenville not a private mega dump for garbage from across ontario the minister has also heard from the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne, who were never consulted. Grand Chief Benedict wrote to remind the minister of his constitutional duty, upheld by the courts, to consult First Nations on such matters. Speaker, there are many compelling and, frankly, constitutional reasons for this minister to get off the sidelines. Will he use his authority to scrap those historic approvals and guarantee no landfill activity at ED19 without a full environmental Question. assessment. Thank you, <laughs> Minister. Well, Speaker, I go back to the fact that uh, that uh, uh, you know there is a need across Ontario for uh, for uh, places to put uh, landfill, places to uh, locate dumps for those things that uh, that can't be diverted away and reused. You know, Speaker. Uh, just uh, a while ago, my predecessor uh, introduced a, uh, uh, a bill around the circular economy uh, because it's built on the adage that uh, one, person's, one person's garbage is another person's uh, treasure. And that's key to moving forward. The circular economy speaker will make sure that as little material as possible ends up as waste in, uh, in landfills, you know? Uh, we are committed to building a, a greener Answer. Ontario. That's why we have the Waste-Free Ontario Act, um, and through this act, uh, uh, through this act, Thank Speaker, you. we'll be saving municipal. Thank you. New no question: The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Last week's release of the Premier's long-delayed, long-term energy plan confirmed what the NDP has been saying since March. The Premier is forcing ratepayers to take out a massive payday loan to artificially and temporarily lower bills before the election. After the election, the bills of Ontario families will rise even higher and faster because they have to pay back an extra $40 billion in interest and principal. But even I was surprised by the sharp rise in hydro rates for industrial consumers which the Premier had excluded from her $40 billion borrowing scheme. Will the Premier explain why, under her plan, northern industrial hydro rates will rise almost 40 per cent between 2019 and 2025? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is important uh, for us to continue to talk about the long-term energy plan, the Fair Hydro plan, and of course, Mr. Speaker, large industrial consumers. We recognize the importance um, of electricity prices for businesses, and this is reflected in many government programs that help businesses make electricity more affordable, such as the ICI program, Save on Energy for Business, Industrial Electricity Incentive, Mr. Speaker, the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, and the Industrial Accelerator program, just to name a few. As well, Mr. Speaker, the long-term uh, energy plan, the 2017 long-term energy price plan, outlook for industrial consumers, reflects average increase in line with inflation, Mr. Speaker, in line with inflation going through right until the end of this long-term uh, uh, energy plan, Mr. Speaker. Answer. So, you know what? This plan is working for in our large industrials and will continue to offer these programs to help to lower their rates Thank even you. more. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Premier. Under the Premier's hydro plan, rates for manufacturers, automakers, steel mills, and other large power consumers will rise by 30 per cent in just six years. Northern industrial customers will be hit even harder. Their rates will rise almost 40 per cent. Instead of getting private profits off hydro bills and bringing Hydro One back under public ownership, the Premier is putting even higher burdens on Ontario's manufacturing sector and northern industries. Will the Premier tell us how many industrial jobs will be lost because of her privatization plan for our hydro system? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to see job growth in our industry, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the leadership of the Minister of Economic Development and Growth and the Premier, Mr. Speaker. We also have just said to him momentarily that the, the long-term energy plan price outlook for our large industry reflects an average increase in the line with inflation. It's also important to say, Mr. Speaker, that the electricity price for electricity or industrial electricity consumers in Ontario is lower than the average price in the Great Lake region, as reported, Mr. Speaker, by the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Rates in Ontario remain competitive. Other Canadian the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. Any other smart aleck remarks? Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And let's be clear, rates in Ontario remain competitive with other Canadian and American jurisdictions, with prices in northern Ontario in particular among the five most affordable jurisdictions on the continent, Mr. Speaker. And that's thanks to the Northern uh, uh, Ontario Industrial Electricity Rate Protection Program, Mr. Speaker, something that Answer. we continue to work with all of our northern industries on. Mr. Speaker, we're working for all consumers, large and small, in this Thank province. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No question. From Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. Recently, a number of women I know took to social media to share deeply personal stories of sexual harassment and violence with the hashtag MeToo. These two simple words have sparked more than mm -hmm. 1.7 to the minister, sorry, to Thank the minister uh, responsible for uh, women's status. These two simple words have sparked more than 1.7 million tweets in 85 different countries. The sheer volume of these stories exposes just how widespread sexual harassment and sexual assault are in our society. Speaker, we know that if we do not talk about important issues like sexual violence and harassment, we will allow it to go unnoticed. We give way to silence and the status quo. Speaker, we know there is a very real stigma around reporting sexual violence and harassment, which prevents some survivors from coming forward. This campaign has opened a critical conversation. Can the Minister of the Status of Women share with us Question. what she is doing to help keep this important conversation going? Yeah. Minister of Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Davenport for this very important question. Speaker, as the Minister of the Status of Women, it's my goal to do everything I can to ensure that women feel safe in this province. But, Speaker, the disturbing accounts of sexual harassment and assault sparked by hashtags like Me Too tell a different story. The reality is that women in our province, country, and around the world are being harassed and assaulted every day. 
and these two simple words have become a rallying call to stand up to gender violence. Speaker, my colleague is right. We must change attitudes on this troubling issue. And I want the women of Ontario to know we are listening. We move forward with a groundbreaking It's Never Okay action plan to stop sexual violence and harassment to shed light on this serious yes, issue. Sir. And our multimedia award-winning public education campaigns have sparked discussions. More work needs to be done, and this government has a plan. I'll explain more in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her answer. And Speaker, hashtags like Me Too have shone a light on how prevalent sexual violence and harassment are in our homes, workplaces, and communities. And while the hashtag MeToo was about opening the conversation, the hashtag WhatNow is a call to action. We know that racialized and Indigenous women are even less likely to report instances of violence. Women are showing enormous courage and strength by speaking out, and we need to make sure they know we are listening. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what the government is doing to fight sexual violence and harassment in Ontario? Minister. Speaker, we know that campaigns like Me Too are exposing serious problems in our society. No question, gender-based violence is far too widespread and has a devastating impact on survivors and their families. And Speaker, that's why we're working hard right now on a gender-based violence strategy that addresses sexual harassment and violence. Our overall gender-based violence strategy will connect work with a sexual violence and harassment action plan, ending violence against Indigenous women, human trafficking initiatives, and update the Domestic Violence Action Plan. The strategy aims to stop domestic violence, improve supports to survivors, and strengthen the justice system's response. Speaker, my ministry, along with the Ministry of Community and Social Services, held engagement sessions with the help of trauma counselors to hear directly from those with experience of gender-based violence. We listen to survivors and experts, use their voices to inform the strategy, and are releasing it. our next steps towards ending gender-based violence. Thank you. will be included in our plan. Your question, a member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. In the Auditor General's 2016 report, the auditor raised serious concerns about the government spending taxpayer dollars on partisan ads. In the report, the auditor said the government's infrastructure ads were, quote, self-congratulatory and aimed at ensuring the government gets credit for its potential future spending. Your latest online infrastructure ad brags about projects in Toronto and Brampton. They are exactly what the auditor said should not be happening. I know the Minister of Energy has chosen to ignore the auditor, but will the Minister of Infrastructure listen to this independent officer of the Assembly and stop spending taxpayers' dollars on partisan ads? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Okay. Okay. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to direct the. Uh, Supplementary to the uh, President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, we're making the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, an unprecedented $190 billion over 13 years. This investment is having positive, life changing impacts across the province. And whether it's a new school or a new hospital, people in Ontario have a right to know about the work we are doing to build better communities. And so we've started a highly localized public awareness campaign to shed light on how our historic investment will affect people in their everyday lives. Showcasing impactful projects is a measure of transparency that helps pull back the curtain on the specific details of our government's plan. As always, we are in full and complete compliance with the government's Advertising Act, one of the most stringent Answer. in the entire country. Mr. Speaker, the people in Ottawa should know that we're making a $200 million extension to the Ottawa Heart Institute. That's important to them. Thank you. Supplementary. Did you even listen to the question? For ever since the government watered down the auditor's oversight of government advertising. That's not helpful. Might have cost you. Please. 
Ever since the government watered down the auditor's oversight of government advertising, the Liberals have been spending millions on partisan ads. Instead of raising awareness about fentanyl crisis or signs of human trafficking or child abuse, the government chooses to brag. The government isn't using these ads to help Ontarians. They're spending taxpayers' dollars to promote the Liberal Party. Will the minister tell Ontarians how much of their money his ministry is wasting on these partisan ads? Minister. President of Treasury Board, Mr. President of the Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And, and Speaker, I do need to point out that Tories Ontario remains the only <laughs> jurisdiction in Canada that actually has legislation banning partisan advertisers. I don't know why Patrick Brown hates infrastructure. The member from the and Carleton is warned. Minister, please. Thank you. We passed this historic legislation because we are against government using taxpayer dollars for partisan advertising. That was our position in 2004, like and Stephen that Harper. is our position now. As part of the 2015 budget, we modernized the Government Advertising Act to give the Auditor General oversight of additional areas of advertising, including digital advertising, transit advertising, and movie theatre Ads, something Answer. that the AG herself had actually asked for. The legislation was also to amended to provide a clear definition of partisan advertising. Thank you. Sorry, it's aid infrastructure. New question, the member from Welland. Questions to the Premier. Liberals have had 14 years to make changes to improve the lives of workers in this province, and yet now, in the final days of this government, it's clear what this Liberal government is willing to do does not go far enough. New Democrats tabled amendments at second reading that ensured that every worker in this province would have the right to join a union in a straightforward process, not just a few preferred sectors. The Liberals voted against that. New Democrats tabled amendments to give every Ontarian the right to take three weeks' vacation after one year, not after an unrealistic five years with the same employer. The Liberals voted against that. The New Democrats' amendments would have provided for five leave days paid for every worker in this province and 10 days for victims of domestic violence. Right. The Liberals voted against that. Why is that? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Speaker, the, uh, the public exercise that accompanies Bill 148 has been very, very thorough, Speaker. We, we had the Changing Workplaces Review. It took about two years, Speaker. We had two excellent advisors travel the province, talk to business, talk to workers, talk to organized labor, talk to a number of groups that had to do with, with the changing workplaces, with the way that workplaces have changed over the years. As a result of that, Speaker, we took that out after first reading because we knew we needed to get as much input as we possibly could on this issue. Speaker, we took the advice we received from labor, from business, from those people, from people that advocate Kate for, uh, for workers, Speaker, and we changed it, Speaker. We brought in amendments. Those amendments were voted for at the committee level, Speaker. It's been through debate in the House, Speaker, again. It's been sent back to the committee. I'm pleased to report today, Speaker, it's going to the committee today. The public will have another chance to tell us what their concerns are, what they like with the bill, Answer. and what changes we should make. This has been a very extensive process, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Speaker. And I think the uh, public has told us card check was the number one priority for everyone. <laughs> New Democrats committed to a $15 minimum wage two years ago. We tabled an amendment that would have actually seen servers and restaurants uh, make the same uh, money as security of other workers in this province by making the same minimum wage, not a two-tiered minimum wage. The Liberal government voted against this. How is that fair? Will this government during this committee process, commit to the same minimum wage for liquor servers in restaurants and for young people. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, about 30 per cent of the people in the province of Ontario make less than $15 an hour. About half of those people, Speaker, are between the ages of 20, 60, uh, 25 and 64. That's a year, Speaker, where you're trying to raise a family. It's where you're buying kids for the clothes, uh, clothes for the kids, Speaker, and it's where you're trying to uh, it's where you're trying to pay your rent, Speaker. It's those important years where you're trying to raise a family. What we've done as a result of this, Speaker, is we've brought in a suggestion that the minimum wage should go to $15 as of 2019, January 1st, 2019. As I remember two years ago, we couldn't get the NDP to talk about the minimum wage, Speaker. I think a little history lesson's involved here. Two paid sick days, Speaker. Three weeks vacation after five 
after uh, five years of employment with the same employer. Equal pay for work of equal Answer. value, Speaker. If you're doing the same work as somebody you're standing next to, you should get paid the same. This is a bet. This is the largest advance. Member from Kitchener Waterloo is warned. You have one sentence. In Ontario's history. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> New question. Member from Ottawa, Ben Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for uh, the uh, Labour Minister. Of uh, Ottawa, Vanier, people talk a lot about Bill 148, and uh, I also have questions about it. I think we know that the constituents are quite interested in the increase to a $15 minimum wage, increasing notice for employees in scheduling, equal pay for equal work, paid six days for everyone, and changes to the unionization process. Now, the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs traveled to Ontario uh, throughout the summer, but this was time uh, unusual because usually the committee work uh, happens after second reading. Can the minister tell us again why the bill was referred to committee after first reading and how that decision impacted our plan Question. to make a uh, workplace fairer? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa, Vanier, for her uh, for this excellent question, also for the advocacy she's uh, she's brought to this bill, Speaker, when we brought in the act, as I was as I was saying in the previous answer, when we brought it in, Speaker, we knew it was going to affect a lot of people in the province of Ontario, Speaker. We needed to get that input. We needed to get it from business. We needed to get it from labour, from poverty advocates. That's why we sent it out to the committee at the first chance we had, Speaker. First reading, it went out. That committee traveled to 10 cities across this province. They heard almost 200 presentations. They received approximately 1,000 written submissions, and they came from families, from workers, employers, labor unions, health professionals. Speaker, what we did is we took that information, we proposed amendments to reflect what the committee members had heard. They addressed some of the concerns of small business, they, can they address some of the concerns of workers, but they maintain yes, their protections that were in the Act, Speaker. Speaker, we know bold steps are needed to support Ontario's workers and their families, and that is exactly what Bill 148 is doing. Thank you. Supplementary. Merci, Monsieur Ministre. This Thank you, Ms. Minister. I think for Ontario to see how the workplaces will become fairer after the bill if it passes. So one issue in particular that interests me is the need to expand job protected leave for victims of domestic, domestic and sexual violence. So we know that it's important for victims to have the time and the support they need to actually deal with tremendously difficult circumstances. So I believe it's really the right decision to amend Bill 148 to establish a new separate leave for victims of domestic and sexual violence. Now that the second reading debate is complete, I look forward to hearing more about what we can do to further strengthen Bill 148. Can the minister please inform the House Question. on what we can expect to see in the coming weeks? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from uh, Ottawa, Vanier. Speaker, I, I'd hope to have the support of the whole House, but Speaker, despite the opposition voting against our plan to make workplaces wow. in Ontario fairer, I'm proud that Bill 148 passed second reading. It's been referred back to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Speaker, it today actually marks, as I said, the, uh, the beginning of the second round of public hearings, where the committee will hear from over 50 groups, unions, business in the province. They'll be made by groups that really represent all walks of Ontario life. There's also the opportunity now, for Speaker, for the public to send in some written submissions to the committee to make sure they're heard. Speaker, in the first go around, the input we received from Ontarians really valuable, really helped to formulate some of the amendments. It helped inform our decisions. And so I look forward to doing exactly the same, Speaker, with the input we received. We're not going to back down from this, Speaker. We're going to make it better. We're going to make Ontario's workplaces fairer. Thank you. New question, the member from Bruce Gray. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of Energy. You've recently re-announced a commitment to refurbish our nuclear fleet, and this is good news. We remain committed to this clean, base load, and effective form of energy. What we don't understand is why you continue to sign exorbitant green energy contracts. 
The reality is your government could have cancelled a number of contracts without penalty, and which would have pro provided relief from the 300 per cent plus rate increases which your government is solely responsible for. The total cost of your green energy experiment is going to cost $133 billion. Wow. If you had to put the people of Ontario first instead of your own partisan political needs and yeah. cancelled these contracts, it would have saved millions of dollars. Through right you, thing. Speaker, will the minister answer to the people of Ontario why you didn't cancel those contracts when you had the chance and why you continue to sign more, having had surplus power currently in our province? Well done. Thank you. Mr. Benedict. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the opposition doesn't have a plan at all for the energy sector, let alone anything to do with clean and reliable power for the province of Ontario. And I know the opposition leader said that he would actually tear up renewable contracts, Mr. Speaker. You know what that would do? That would expose us to $20 billion in lawsuits and costs, and it signals to business that Ontario can't be trusted, Mr. Speaker. But let's look. Let's look at what we've done with renewable power in this province. We now benefit from over 90 percent emissions-free electricity, Mr. Speaker. We are the envy of North America when it comes to the grid that we have. Clean energy initiatives have generated over 42,000 jobs at more than 30 solar and wind manufacturers across the province. And we also, Mr. Speaker, talked about looking at the LRP2 and suspending that contract because we are in a robust supply. But if you would look at the long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, yes, you would see that a few years down the road, we're not going to be in that robust supply. And nuclear, Mr. Speaker, the refurb will continue to provide a lot of that Thank green you. power for us. Thanks, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, this minister is clearly out of touch. Mm -hmm. If his government had committed $133 billion to the refurbishment projects, instead of playing politics, these projects would have been in progress, ensuring clean, baseload, cost-effective power, while ensuring 60,000 well-paying direct and indirect jobs across our province. The completion of these projects would have actually resulted in lower energy costs, as opposed to the huge increases of 300 per cent that have resulted during your 14 years. These rate increases are forcing closure of schools, cuts to hospitals and long-term care homes, and the hikes are leaving businesses and households in the dark and forcing hundreds of companies and jobs out of Ontario. Speaker, through you, will the minister be straight with the people of Ontario? Will you admit your sale of Hydro One and the debt incurred by your recent unfair Hydro Act will result in higher rates in the future. Here, here, here. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Speaker. So um, let's be clear, the investments that are happening from this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, are, are endless. I never have enough time to talk about the billions of dollars that we're putting into transit, Mr. Speaker, into roads and infrastructure. We continue to build more and more on this side of the, the House, Mr. Speaker, because we're building Ontario up. When it comes to our renewable industry, Mr. Speaker, it is a success story. As I said before, we're home to 30 solar and wind manufacturers including Helene in Sault Ste. Marie, CS Wind in Windsor, Silfab Solar in Mississauga. Ontario trains uh, wind power technicians and other experts in the renewable sector at Fanshawe College, at St. Lawrence College, and at St. Clair College. We also have an industry based in innovation, which we're exporting to other countries and jurisdictions looking to low, uh, follow our lead on green energy policy. Laraxian in Oakville, um, renewable energy strategy and knowledge to global markets. Solar wall, Mr. Speaker, is just endless. <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry on a point of order. Point. Thank you, Speaker. I wanted to introduce in the Members East, East Gallery two residents of Cambridge, uh, Rich Reese and Lynn LaPlante. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. to, uh, to welcome uh, uh, members of uh, staff from the Anishinaabe uh, Abby Nuji um, Family Services who are joining us here in the Legislature. Welcome to the Legislature. Thank you. Now the question period is over. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Leeds Grenville has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change concerning ED19 landfill site. Never too late to get a warning. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. There are no further there are no deferred votes. This house stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.